Following nearly three years of war, the Union had failed to subdue much of the rebellious South, even with the blockade and some significant military victories. Federal forces held a few enclaves along the East Coast, all of Tennessee, and some other scattered territory. They also controlled the Mississippi River, splitting the South in two. But the bulk of Confederate territory, especially the Deep South, was untouched. The principal Southern armies in Georgia and Virginia were also as strong as ever, with no end to the war in sight. With the critical presidential election approaching, many Northerners were becoming weary of the casualties and the costs of the war. During the first few months of 1864, President Lincoln would prepare the Union Army for a renewed effort to crush Confederate forces. He appointed Ulysses S. Grant to overall command and called for another 500,000 volunteers. Federal forces would move against Robert E. Lee's army around Richmond and Petersburg and advance on Atlanta. With the primary Union efforts focused on Georgia and Virginia, Confederate forces in North Carolina went on the offensive, trying to recover some of the territory lost to Burnside's expedition. That effort was led by Major General George Pickett, who had been put in charge of the Confederate Department of Southern Virginia and North Carolina a few months after his famous charge at Gettysburg. Pickett's primary target was Newburn, a vital seaport and transportation center that had been occupied by federal forces since March 1862. Robert E. Lee informed Confederate President Jefferson Davis on January 2nd that any attempt to recapture Newburn should be made soon. Lee wrote, I can spare troops for the purpose, which will not be the case as spring approaches. A multi-pronged attack plan was developed for Pickett by North Carolina General Robert Hoke. Prong one, Hoke would attack Newburn from the west, coming in on the Neuse Road. Prong two, would come in from the north, on north of the Neuse River, take Fort Anderson, turn the guns at Fort Anderson on Newburn. Prong three would be soldiers coming in from the south, south of the Trent River, crossing the Trent River, and attacking Newburn from the south. The fourth prong would be a group of, of uh, Navy men, and I hate to use the word Navy men because a lot of them were riffraff and just anybody who had any information or any experience on the water. But they would come down from Kenston on the Neuse River and capture the federal gunboats and take the guns on the federal gunboats and turn those guns on the forts in Newburn and attack that way. All four prongs would attack Newburn at the same time, uh, meaning that Newburn is being attacked from all four directions. Hoke led one prong of the attack from the west with between 5,000 and 6,000 men. They advanced along the Noose Road toward Batchelder's Creek, running into Union defenders there on February 1st. There are rumors in among the, in the federal camp that there are Confederates in the area, but Colonel Peter Classen, who is in charge, passes that off as only rumors. He has defended, he has the defenses set up uh, for the camp, which is an outpost of the, of the Federals, 10 miles west of Newburn. The bridge crossing Batchelder's Creek, the bridge, the uh, boards on across the, the bridge have been taken up, and the only thing left are the skeleton that is holding the bridge up. He has men there to guard that bridge so that nobody can cross it. The defenders would eventually be driven off by infantry and artillery fire brought upon them by the larger Confederate force. Hoke pursued the Federals toward Fort Totten, stopping about a mile from the fort. Fort Totten was the largest fortification manned by the Federals around Newburn. It covered six to eight acres and was built by formerly enslaved people after the town was occupied in 1862. And each side of the fort had five guns or five cannon on top of the fort to protect the town. At the end, at, on the outside of the fort, was a three-foot ditch surrounding the fort. Inside the fort, there was uh, barracks built as well as tents to man 
uh, to house the men inside the fort. In 1862, there were about between four and 500 men manning the fort. In 1864, at the time of the third attack on Newburn, there were only 200 to 250 men. As Hoke moved on Newburn from the west, Colonel James Deering was working on his part of the plan which was to capture Fort Anderson and turn its guns on the town. Deering attacks uh, Fort Anderson with about 3,000 men. Colonel Anderson is defending uh, Fort Anderson with about 250 to 300 men. Despite significantly outnumbering the defenders, Deering decided Fort Anderson was too strong to attack. He withdrew to Kinston the next day. Meanwhile, moving on Newburn from the south was General Seth Barton, who had advanced from Kinston with about 5,000 men. So Barton left Kinston on January the 30th and headed towards Newburn. He crossed the Trent River and, led, and came towards Newburn south of the Trent River, arriving at this point just south of Newburn on, January, on February the 1st. Across the river from here, he could see Newburn, could see actually people in the backyards of their houses, could see cherry blossoms and apple blossoms blooming in the trees. In Newburn, there were about 5,000 federal troops. He looked over and examined the, the uh, town of Newburn and decided that there was no way he could capture Newburn. Now, on the west side of Newburn, General Hope was waiting for Seth Barton to attack, and he was listening for the guns of the attack so he would know to attack from the west. Seth Barton decided he could not attack Newburn and capture it. The naval component of the Confederate attack was led by a contingent of some 250 men in a dozen small boats under John Taylor Wood. They were to capture or destroy Federal gunboats protecting the town. As they got outside of Kinston, the fog was so thick they couldn't see their hands in front of their faces, so they turned back and went back to Kinston. The next night, February the 1st, they headed back to Newburn. This time the fog was still thick, but they headed on down to the river towards Newburn. When they got to Newburn, they found one federal gunboat, and that was the USS Underwriter. The assault force boarded the Underwriter, and vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued. In the fierce fighting, the captain of the underwriter was killed and a number of others were killed. At the same time, a number of uh, crew members of the underwriter jumped overboard and swam to shore, landing at this point here. Realizing the ship had been captured by Confederates, Union shore batteries fired upon the vessel. Woods' assault force set fire to the underwriter and abandoned it. The ship exploded and sank early on February 2nd. In support of the attack on Newburn, Brigadier General James G. Martin was ordered to attack the Federal garrison at Newport Barracks about 25 miles south of Newburn. He left Wilmington with about 2,000 men. Halfway between Newburn and Moorhead City, on the Newport River was a, uh, was a set of federal barracks. The purpose of the federals there was to control the railroad between Newburn and Moorhead, as well as control the telegraph lines between Newburn and Moorhead. It was very important that the Confederates capture this particular uh, post because they did not want the federals in Newburn to be contacting the federals in Moorhead because if they did, the Federals in, in Moorhead would come to the aid of the Federals in Newburn during the battle. So Confederates then came in uh, from Swansboro, came into, New, uh, into um, Newport, and a big fight began between the Federals and the Confederates at Newport. While the 900-man Union garrison would eventually be driven off, the Confederates would fail in their attempt to retake Newburn. Three men from the 9th Vermont were awarded Medals of Honor for their actions at Newport Barracks. The, uh, the attack on Newburn totally fails for a number of reasons. One, General Barton 
did not do his part in attacking Guburn because he felt like he did not have the forces available to attack Guburn from the south of Trent River. So he turned around and hightailed it back to Kinston. Deering, here General Deering felt that he could not attack or did not or failed to attack completely and take over Fort Anderson. He had an outstanding number of men. He could have taken over Fort Anderson, but he chose not to do so. He figured, you know, he asked them to surrender. They would not do so, but he could have captured Fort Anderson by just attacking, going in and charging and taking over the fort. He failed to do so, so he backed off and went back to Kinston. The naval assault of Newburn down the Neuse River was a failure. They only captured one gunboat and it sank. The other gunboats were totally not around and so they were not captured. The only successful uh, attack was done by Hope. He captured uh, Batchelder's Creek. He got to within a mile of the fort, uh, Fort Thompson, uh, Fort Totten. He was sitting there waiting for the others to take place. The other attacks failed, so he, he was not, he was left totally alone, and he had no choice but to retreat. So the battle of, the third battle of Newburn was a total failure. Although they failed to recapture Newburn, the Confederates scored victories in the destruction of the underwriter and the Union base at Newport Barracks. Pickett soon would be recalled to Virginia, and Hoke would again take command. Hoke would lead another attempt to recapture Newburn in May, but that would be called off by the Confederate High Command. The port city would remain in federal control for the rest of the war. The Civil War had a significant impact on Native Americans. The bitter conflict divided the political loyalties of indigenous peoples, just as it had non-Indian communities. First Nations' support of the Union and Confederate causes was generally driven by their experiences with and economic ties to non-Indians, their geographic locations, attitudes about slavery, and community needs. In 1862, Colonel William H. Thomas, who was the first and only white man to serve as a Cherokee chief, recruited tribal members to serve alongside non-Indians in a Confederate unit. That unit would be known as Thomas's Legion, or the Highland Rangers. The troop later was named the 69th North Carolina. Hundreds of Cherokees would serve in the Legion, which fought in western sections of North Carolina and in Tennessee and Virginia. In early 1864, members of Thomas's Legion took part in a raid on Union supply lines in Tennessee. After the Confederate raiders withdrew back into North Carolina, the 14th Illinois was dispatched to destroy the unit. On February 2nd, the Federal horsemen caught up with Thomas's troops on Deep Creek in western North Carolina. Accounts differ about the fight, also known as the Battle of Qualatown. But casualties were relatively low, and a number of Confederates, including Cherokee, were captured. The battle, along with other issues affecting the tribe, undermined further recruiting efforts by Thomas and led to native desertions from the Confederate service and cause. Members of the Legion served in the final engagement in North Carolina at Waynesville in May 1865 and were among the last soldiers east of the Mississippi to surrender. Since early in the war, the battle lines in eastern North Carolina had been shifting as Union and Confederate forces grappled for control of the coast. Its war-weary population was home to divided loyalties. In occupying New Bern, Federal forces controlled much of the local economy. North Carolina had a significant number of Unionists, and locals that served in the Confederate Army were often sent to fight far away from home. So men who weren't particularly strong loyalists could be enticed to don a Union uniform. So many of the men who were conscripted into the Confederate Army were lured away by a deliberate plan by Lincoln's War Cabinet. And the plan was something like this, that it was better to get these men out of the Confederate Army than have to fight them. And it didn't matter what shape they were in. There were complaints that many of them were old, infirm, physically disabled. They didn't care. 
the idea was it was just cheaper to buy them off, get them into the Union lines, uh, give them garrison duty, what have you. And so a number of these men were recruited into the United States Army and promised a couple of things. One, they would get a $300 bonus for enlisting. Two, they'd be used only on garrison duty in local forts and would never really have to go into battle, certainly never be sent to the battlefields of Virginia. And this seemed like a pretty good deal. This is the cold weather, the crops are done for the year, the fishing is done for the year. And what they don't figure on is that North Carolina is about to be invaded by a Confederate army. General George Pickett's campaign in eastern North Carolina came after his division had been destroyed at Gettysburg in July 1863. Even before he failed to retake New Bern, he had become broken and bitter. Desertion was a significant problem for the Confederacy, particularly among North Carolina troops. Local men were being drawn to Union service. Still smarting from his most recent failure, Pickett was eager to make an example of deserters. So at this point in the war, uh, punishment for desertion has gotten uh, far more and more draconian. In the early part of the war, uh, you were welcomed back into unit if you returned. Uh, often you might be flogged, given some other punishment. Then it became branding, and then it became, no, we have to execute some of you to make sure the other ones stick. And so that is the, the rationale that, um, that Pickett has in his mind. During the recent fight at Newburn, Confederates took a federal blockhouse manned by men of Company F of the 2nd North Carolina Union Volunteer Regiment. The Tar Heel soldiers had been urging their commanding officer to withdraw to safety, but their pleas were ignored. Fifty-three prisoners from the regiment were taken back to Kinston. Of the 53 men, they identified 22 as deserters, but it turns out that's not actually true. Most of them were not deserters. Most of them had served in either Home Guard or Railroad Guard units, which were North Carolina units not subject to the discipline of the Confederate Army. And several others, in fact, probably had been at conscription camps but left before taking the oath of allegiance. And therefore, under the rules of war, codified, by the way, in 1863 by a guy named Francis Lieber and issued as Lincoln's General Orders Number 100, 156 articles governing the conduct of war and the treatment of prisoners of war. Uh, these guys were entitled to be treated without any kind of retribution at all, but in fact they weren't. All were put on trial. One of the guys that helps them betray each other is Reverend John Paris, who is a quote-unquote chaplain, uh, and who, after these men are hanged, actually preaches uh, uh, about the betrayal of Judas Iscariot of Jesus, as if he had not himself simply done that very same thing in turning these men against each other and finding men who are implicated in turning them in for, for punishment. Uh, and so 22 men are hanged in four batches, two, five, 13, and two more. And this is meant to discipline the ranks that are left. The men are made to stand in a square around the scaffold and watch this time after time in cold, biting, rainy weather. And it has the opposite effect. Indeed, it leads to a, a, ra a rash of people deserting. I think the first hangings led to two dozen desertions, and then it continued. The men got more and more outraged, more and more dispirited, more and more disgusted, as were the, the citizens of Kinston that witnessed it. And the treatment of the men after they were hanged was even, if anything, worse. Um, when they were cut down, the hangman was allowed to strip their clothing. Other people cut their buttons off for souvenirs. Some were buried right at the foot of the scaffold. One man was said to be naked except for his socks. And the families, in many cases, were just too intimidated to come and reclaim the bodies of their loved ones. So the whole episode from start to finish had an air of calculated vengeance and depravity about it. Among those hanged were 44-year-old Amos Armiet and Elijah Kellum. The latter was described as having a physical deformity and had been rejected twice for service in the Confederate Army. None of the 22 men who were hanged had lived past their 90 days of enlistment or received the $300 bounty promised by Union recruiters. The remaining 31 prisoners were scattered among Confederate prison camps. Most died within a few months from disease or malnutrition. Only three are known to have survived and received a parole. Pickett would face investigations and a board of inquiry after the Civil War. He fled to Canada, returning to Virginia after his former West Point classmate, General Ulysses S. Grant, intervened on his behalf. <laughs>
Pickett would be snubbed after the war by other former Confederate officers, including Robert E. Lee. The anecdote that best captures for me the ignominy that Pickett suffered throughout a long career of failure after Gettysburg, after Kinston, after Sailor's Creek, is that when he dies in uh, Norfolk about 10 years after the war of liver failure from, from hard drinking, it's two days before the Richmond Dispatch will print any news of his death. And the reason is they're occupied celebrating the new statue to Stonewall Jackson on Monument Avenue. The CSS Albemarle was the namesake vessel in the Albemarle class of Confederate ironclads. Uh, it was designed by Confederate naval constructor John Luke Porter. And it was referred to as a diamond hull design because if you looked at the drawings from the end, it, it was kind of a diamond shape. Uh, these ships were built with flat bottoms uh, so that they were shallow enough draft to operate in the rivers and sounds of eastern North Carolina. While there were initially supposed to be three ironclads in this class, only two were built, the CSS Albemarle and the CSS Noose in Kinston. The third vessel had begun construction at Tarboro but was destroyed by a Union raid in July of 1863, well before it was completed. The CSS Albemarle was built upriver from Plymouth at a place called Edwards Ferry. It was built in a cornfield alongside the river, which certainly was not an ideal uh, situation for constructing an ironclad, but the Confederates were making do as best they could. The Albemarle was 158 feet long. Its beam was 34 feet, and it had a draft of 8 or 9 feet. She had 4 inches of armor plating on the casemate and a 2-inch belt of armor plating at the waterline. The deck and everything below the deck were left unplated. The ironclad was armed with two 6.4-inch Brook rifles. The Union forces here at Plymouth always knew that there was an ironclad being built upriver. It was something that concerned them. Uh, and they knew one day that ironclad would appear uh, from upriver. They just didn't know when. In April of 1864, as General Robert F. Hoke made an attempt to retake Plymouth from the federal forces here, the ironclad was ordered to launch and come down river. The commander, James W. Cook, launched the ship before she was completed. On the way down river, workmen were still working on the ironclad, putting finishing touches on the ironclad. They had a portable forge on the deck of the ship that they were using to, to complete the work. They found the ship was difficult to steer, and so they turned it around backwards and descended the river stern first while dragging their anchors behind them to, to help stabilize the vessel. However, once the vessel arrived here at Plymouth, she was complete, or as complete as she would be, and Cook quickly readied the ship for action. The Union fleet at Plymouth was commanded by Charles W. Flusser. Among his ships were the Miami and the Southfield. Well, as the Albemarle appeared coming down river, this thing that they had feared for so long was now right in front of them, and they had to come up with a plan to try to combat it. Flusser decided that they would try to ensnare the Albemarle between the two ships and pound it in, into submission. Uh, he connected the Miami and the Southfield using chains and nets and wanted to catch the Albemarle in between. As Cook brought the Albemarle into action, he realized very quickly what Flusser was trying to do. And in order to counter that action, he went full speed ahead at the Union ships and swung the Albemarle hard to starboard. The Confederate ironclad punched a large hole in the side of the south field, causing the Federal ship to sink rapidly. While this certainly created uh, panic on board the south field, it created some concern on the CSS Albemarle as well because the bow of the Albemarle was hung up inside the south field and as the south field was sinking, she was taking the Albemarle with her. Confederate sailors began to get concerned as the water got closer to their forward gun ports. 
Luckily for the Albemarle, when the Southfield hit bottom, she listed to one side, and when she did, the Albemarle popped free up out of the hole like a cork. Flusser was still determined to, to try to damage the Albemarle as much as he could, and he pulled the lanyard on a 9-inch Dahlgren gun on board the USS Miami. Unfortunately, that was a bad decision for Flusser. The shell ricocheted off the casemate of the Albemarle back over onto the Miami and exploded, immediately killing Flusser and numerous other sailors. At that point, the Union Navy disengaged from the conflict, and the Albemarle was free to assist the Confederate Army in their attack on Plymouth. Cook immediately refocused his efforts on the Union fortifications around Plymouth and began shelling them from the river. In the end, the Albemarle ended up being the, the deciding factor in the Battle of Plymouth, in, in the fact that it was able to shell the Union fortifications from the river and force the Union to surrender. After the battle, the Albemarle came to dock here at Plymouth and was, was here for quite some time defending the town from any efforts by the Union to recapture. After Pickett failed to take Newburn and return to Virginia, General Robert F. Hoke was once again in command. Hoke soon planned an attack on the strategic port town of Plymouth. Union forces had occupied the town since May 1862 and used the site as a major supply depot. About 2,800 federal troops under Brigadier General Henry Wessels defended Plymouth with an extensive system of forts, redoubts, and trenches. Fortifications ran all the way to the northeastern corner of town. In the middle of that line of defense was a very formidable Fort Williams, completely enclosed and uh, complete with bomb shelters for the soldiers in the fort. The eastern end of town was mostly open, protected by a large swamp and a small creek, Conaby Creek, but also by a redoubt, Conaby Redoubt, and a small fort, Fort Comfer. Less than a mile from the western edge of town was Fort Wessels, also known as the 85th Redoubt, because the 85th New York were the ones that constructed it. Fort Wessels was a formidable um, fort in its own right. And then about a mile and a half upriver from there was Fort Gray. And Fort Gray was situated on the narrows of the river and its guns were aimed mostly at the river in order to prevent any gunboats from the Confederacy coming down the river to help Plymouth. Hoke's plans to capture Plymouth involved the use of the ironclad the CSS Albemarle to face off against the Federal gunboats patrolling the area. In preparation for the Battle of Plymouth, Robert F. Hoke was given command of land and water forces by President Jefferson Davis. This was a unique situation. He was the first commander to have and been authorized to be in command of a joint force expedition. Now, there were other joint force expeditions in the Confederacy, but this is the first time he had command of both land and water. Hoke rendezvoused with Confederates led by Matt Ransom and part of James Kemper's brigade at Tarboro a combined force of about 7,000 men. April 17th was the first day of the Battle of Plymouth. When Hoke's forces attacked Plymouth, Ransom's brigade was the first in and deployed to the east of the main road in front of the southern fortifications of the town. Hoke stayed on the main road and invested Fort Wessels, and Kemper's brigade under Terry went off to the west to attack Fort Gray. Clearing the swamp in the wooded area, Terry's men came under a murderous fire from Fort Gray. They soon found out why. There were white markers in the field. At first, the men thought that they were dropped handkerchiefs or surrender flags. Soon they realized that there were targets that had been placed to find range and uh, distance. Facing accurate and deadly cannon fire, Terry and Ransom's brigade that was moving in on Fort Williams abandoned their assaults. At dark, refugees driven into Plymouth in front of the advancing Confederate forces were evacuated. Men, women, children all got on the USS Massasoit and left for Roanoke Island. As the Albemarle had yet to arrive on the scene, 
Union gunboats were free to shell the Confederates, helping drive off attacks on the Federal fortifications. That night, the Albemarle slipped past Fort Gray and would engage the Federal gunboats the morning of the 19th. As the Albemarle passed Fort Gray, the fort fired upon her. One of the sailors aboard the Albemarle reported that the firing had little effect, much like peas against a tin can. Now the CSS Albemarle was loose on the lower Roanoke. The Confederate ironclads sank the USS Southfield and drove off the USS Miami and two other Union warships on the scene and then provided supporting fire for Confederate assaults on the fortifications. On the morning of April 20th, Ransom's brigade attacked the eastern side of Plymouth. There were only two small fortifications there, Fort Canfee and the Canopy Redoubt. Both of those were encircled and captured. And then hoax men moved into the eastern side of town, following the east-west streets until they reached the western edge of town. Remember, the fortifications were designed to defend the other front and so were opened on the east side. And thus, when his men attacked, they had little choice but to surrender the fortifications. Battery were surrendered and most of the redoubts around it. The holdout on that line on the southwest corner was the African Americans and the North Carolina Unionists who were stationed at that location. Most of the southern defenses surrendered except for Fort Williams. The 8th North Carolina charged Fort Williams. They were not authorized to do so, and they were repulsed with heavy losses. Wessels had previously rejected demands of surrender, including an earlier attempt by his men to do so. However, heavy shelling from both hoax artillery and the Albemarle finally forced Wessels to cede his stronghold at Fort Williams. Now, some of those men had escaped either just before Fort Williams fell or just after Fort Williams fell to a nearby swamp. They were followed by Confederate cavalry who then hunted those men for the rest of the day. The cavalry did not bring back any prisoners. The number of men executed is debatable. That something happened that day in terms of execution is not debatable. The Battle of Plymouth was the third largest battle fought in North Carolina, and it proved to be one of the last Confederate victories of the Civil War. After Plymouth fell, Union forces abandoned Washington, North Carolina, and they looted and partially burned the town as they left. Hoke was unable to follow up his victories with an attack on Newburn, and he and his men were recalled to Virginia when Union forces threatened Petersburg and Richmond. The Confederates would hold Plymouth until the Albemarle was sunk by raiders in October 1864. Following the Battle of Plymouth, the Confederates were not content to allow the Albemarle to sit here at dock idly. Uh, the, the idea was to eventually get the Albemarle down to New Bern in, in hopes of recapturing that town as well. The difficulty involved there meant that the Albemarle would have to steam downriver through the Albemarle Sound and pass the Union stronghold at Roanoke Island, where a good portion of the Union fleet was uh, located. In early May, Cook readied the Albemarle to go downriver in just such an effort. He had in consort with him two smaller uh, vessels, the cotton plant and the bombshell. On May 5th, the three ships left the dock here at Plymouth and went down river, arriving at the mouth of the Albemarle Sound. Arriving at the Sound, Cook saw six Union warships awaiting his arrival. He ordered the cotton plant and the bombshell back up river to Plymouth. The cotton plant complied, but for some unknown reason, the bombshell remained in consort with the Albemarle steaming behind in the ironclad's wake. Captain Melanchthon Smith, in command of the Union fleet, 
had an idea for trying to defeat the Albemarle. He wanted to approach the Confederate ship in two columns, one passing to the Albemarle's uh, port and one passing to the starboard. James Cook, commanding the Albemarle, quickly realized what Smith planned. As the ironclad approached, Cook turned her hard to starboard to engage the Federal fleet. The first Union ship that the Albemarle and bombshell engaged was the USS Matabeset. The bombshell sustained some damage, but not enough for her to disengage. At this point, Union ships were passing by the Albemarle, and ships were trading fire back and forth. The Albemarle sporadically firing as each Union ship passed. The bombshell was also engaging the Union fleet, specifically the USS Sassacus. The Sassacus ended that engagement very quickly by firing a broadside into the bombshell with devastating effect. The bombshell was holed in three separate locations and began taking on water fast. At that point, the bombshell disengaged and, and made their way to shore and surrendered. Upon accepting the surrender of the bombshell, the Sassacus returned to the engagement with the Albemarle, having at this point drifted three or four hundred yards away from the Albemarle. However, the commander of the Sassacus realized that he was facing the broad side of the Albemarle and had a perfect opportunity to ram the ship. The Sassacus steamed towards the Albemarle full speed ahead and slammed into the side of the ship, breaking the bow of the Sassacus in the process. The hit that was absorbed by the Albemarle was so ferocious that the Albemarle listed to one side, throwing most of the sailors hard to the deck. At this point, Cook realized he had the perfect opportunity to fire on the Sassacus as the two ships were side by side. The guns of the Albemarle fired into the Sassacus, ripping through the deck into the engine room and exploding the boiler in the Sassacus, scalding and killing many of the sailors below deck. The Sassacus was badly damaged at this point and disengaged from the uh, battle. Unfortunately, the Albemarle was also heavily damaged, particularly her smokestack. Having been riddled by shot and shell from the Union fleet, the smokestack was so damaged that the engines were having trouble. Uh, there wasn't enough draw from the boilers to keep the engines operating at peak efficiency, and Cook realized that he was going to have trouble getting back upstream, back upriver to Plymouth. Cook decided his best course of action was to disengage and head back up river. The engineers below deck informed him that the engines were not powered well enough to really get back up river and that something would have to be done to try to increase the draw. Cook ordered every piece of wood that could be thrown into the fire to be thrown in. Furniture was, was broken up and, and put into the fireboxes to try to get up enough steam. This wasn't enough. Someone on the Albemarle had the brilliant idea that maybe they should throw all their bacon, ham, and lard that was on board into the fire, knowing that this would burn hot enough to get enough steam back up in the boilers. So every bit of meat and every bit of lard that was on board the Albemarle was thrown into the, into the fire boxes to create enough steam pressure and enough draw to get the engines running well enough to get back up river to Plymouth. The CSS Albemarle, it was said, returned to Plymouth on bacon power. It was said that as she steamed back up river and arrived in Plymouth, the smell of bacon was in the air. But it was that bit of Confederate ingenuity that helped the sailors on the CSS Albemarle make it back up river to Plymouth. 
Unfortunately, that was the last time that the Albemarle would engage the Union fleet in May of 1864 as she returned to her dock here in Plymouth. Following the Battle of Albemarle Sound in May of 1864, the CSS Albemarle remained here at the dock in Plymouth. James W. Cook, her commander from the beginning, took leave from the Navy due to his seriously declining health. At least one Union Naval officer had his sights set on destroying the CSS Albemarle. That was William Parker Cushing, a young Union Naval officer who became known for his daring raids behind enemy lines. North Carolina Civil War historian Dr. Chris Fonville believes that Cushing's motivation to destroy the Albemarle came from his deep friendship with Charles Flusser and his wish to avenge Flusser's death by destroying the Albemarle. In September of 1864, Cushing pitched his plan to the Union Naval Command and was given permission to go ahead with his attempt. Cushing went north to New York to retrieve two picket boats with which he would carry out his attack. One of those boats sank before arriving in North Carolina, but Cushing decided to move forward with his plan. Alexander Worley had taken command of the CSS Albemarle in September and had taken measures to protect the Albemarle from attack. Those measures included constructing a log boom around the Albemarle to deter anyone from approaching the ship too closely. Cushing arrived back in the Albemarle Sound on October 24th. And on the night of October 27th, he launched his attack against the Albemarle. Steaming upriver, the first thing that he had to accomplish was passing the Confederate pickets without being noticed. Confederates had stationed pickets downriver near the wreck of the USS Southfield. The night was dark and rainy, just the type of night that Cushing had hoped for to carry out his attack, and he was able to elude the pickets without being noticed. As he approached Plymouth, he lined himself up on the opposite bank of the river in order to prepare for his approach to the ironclad. Cushing deployed a spar torpedo and steamed across the river. He was spotted by Confederates on board the Albemarle, and when hailed, he gave no reply. The Confederates, realizing that they were under attack, opened fire on Cushing's picket boat. But Cushing maintained his course, steaming directly for the CSS Albemarle. He had a head of steam as he approached. He was able to slide across the log boom as the logs were very slippery. He planted the torpedo, the spar torpedo, at the Albemarle's hull and pulled the lanyard. The explosion not only blew a hole in the side of the Albemarle, but did great damage to Cushing's picket boat. Many of his men were killed either from Confederate fire or from the explosion. Others bailed out and were captured, but some, including Cushing, were able to swim to shore and elude capture. Cushing hid out in the swamps and aided by a local African American, managed to find his way back to Union lines and report that he had in fact sunk the CSS Albemarle. On October 31st, just four days after Cushing's attack, Union forces sweeped in and recaptured Plymouth from the Confederates. Only a few days later, Washington, North Carolina was also recaptured, and much of eastern North Carolina was again back in Union hands. On December 9th, a Union naval expedition was launched to capture Confederate defenses at Rainbow Bluff on the Roanoke River in North Carolina. The Federal Expeditionary Force also was on a mission to capture or destroy a rebel ram that was rumored to be under construction nearby.
One of the gunboats participating in the Rainbow Bluff expedition, the USS Otsego, struck two mines near Jamesville and sank up to her gun deck. The federal tugboat USS Baisley went in to assist the Otsego, but she also struck a mine and went down immediately. The gunboat USS Wyalusing and other naval patrol boats continued a cautious advance upriver, but they abandoned their mission after finding the approaches heavily mined and the defenses at Rainbow Bluff reinforced. The Wyalusing and her sister vessels in the Rainbow Bluff expedition returned to Plymouth late that month and resumed their blockade and amphibious support duties. Some 100 miles to the southwest of Newburn, the critical port city of Wilmington remained in Confederate control. When the Civil War began, it was the largest city in North Carolina. During the war, the port was a venue for blockade running. The blockade runners traded with European partners and helped supply the people and armies of the Confederacy. The geography of the Cape Fear River and limited resources of the Union Navy allowed for successful blockade running for most of the conflict. About 20 miles downriver from Wilmington stood Fort Fisher, the key defensive fortification protecting the critical port city. Uh, the commander of the fort for most of the war was Colonel William Lamb of Norfolk. Uh, when he took over on July 4, 1862, after inspecting the works, uh, he said that a single broadside from a U.S. Navy frigate could destroy the fort. And so he determined to build a fort that could withstand the fury and the might of the United States Navy. Uh, and over the next two and a half years, built a fort that was considered by most observers to be virtually impregnable. The fortification was now the largest earthen fort in the Confederacy. It held 47 guns. Ulysses S. Grant, now in overall command of Union forces, was reluctant to commit the necessary troops to capture Fort Fisher and Wilmington. Uh, he believed he needed more men around Petersburg, not fewer, but he understood President Lincoln's political dilemma. The fighting uh, had grown so bloody uh, and uh, had, had reached that stalemate uh, status uh, that the media took to calling uh, Grant a butcher. President Lincoln predicted in July of 1864 that he would be uh, unable to uh, retain his position as president, would not be returned to the White House uh, unless something occurred to turn the tide of uh, the war in favor of the Union. So when, uh, when the last seaport on the Gulf Coast, Mobile, Alabama, was closed, by Admiral David Farragut's uh, forces on August the 5th, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells rushed to the White House and implored President Lincoln to now support a, an attack on Wilmington. It was the last lifeline. It was Lee's lifeline. And if it could be cut, then the collapse of the Confederacy might well occur uh, soon thereafter. Lincoln agreed to the plan, but he deferred to Grant about the timing of the operation. It was not until December 1864 that federal forces made their attempt to capture Fort Fisher. The attack was carried out by ground forces commanded by Major General Benjamin Butler, supported by a 64 warship armada under Admiral David Porter. Uh, Confederate intelligence was good. Uh, the Confederates at Wilmington knew the attack was coming. Uh, they were well prepared. Uh, the politics of command, however, uh, haunted the Confederate hierarchy here. Uh, the commanding general of the District of the Cape Fear for more than two years was Major General W.H.C. Whiting, uh, who was much beloved by his soldiers, uh, somewhat uh, difficult uh, to deal with uh, in terms of the, the high command. And when the Confederacy was finally convinced that a serious attack on Wilmington was forthcoming, President Jefferson Davis decided to remove Whiting from command. He and Whiting had sparred throughout the war and to replace him with General Braxton Bragg, the most vilified, controversial general in the Confederate Army. In fact, when the Virginia media caught wind that Bragg was going to be sent to Wilmington, they said, goodbye, Wilmington. <laughs>
So Bragg comes to Wilmington in late October of 1864 to take over command from General Whiting, which was a, a terrible blow, not only to, uh, to General Whiting, but to the men under his command who so respected and, and admired him. So uh, with uh, the attack imminent on Wilmington, General Lee detached one of his finest divisions, commanded by General Robert F. Hoke, containing more than 6,000 soldiers to keep Wilmington in Confederate hands and open to blockade running. Uh, unfortunately, Hoke's division did not arrive in time to participate in the first Fort Fisher battle. Uh, they had to make a sort of circuitous route by rail, and so they were still coming into the port uh, around Christmas when the Union fleet appeared offshore. The Union Navy began the attack by detonating a ship filled with gunpowder an attempt to destroy the fortifications that failed. Admiral Porter allowed his gunboat commanders to concentrate their initial fire on the most visible targets inside the fort, which were Confederate flags. Uh, from their position a mile to a mile and a quarter offshore, the sand mounds and traverses appeared, as one sailor said, like haycocks in the distance. But the flags floating above the fort were easily discernible, and so the gunboat commanders allowed their gunners to establish their effective range of fire on shore by targeting the flags. And Colonel Lamb inside the fort uh, recognized what was happening, and so he moved all the flags to the back side of the fort and sure enough, the fleet redirected a lot of its bombardment toward the position, the new positions of the flags. Uh, Colonel Lamb later wrote that it was the biggest waste of gunpowder in the uh, annals of warfare as at least one third of the 20,261 shot and shell thrown at the fort went over the fort and into the marsh or the river behind. The Union assault on the fort was called off after Butler decided that the defenses had not been weakened sufficiently. Federal forces would return in January, with the infantry now under the command of Alfred Terry. The fort, and then Wilmington, would fall in early 1865. When 1864 came to a close, Southern hopes of independence were fading. Union morale in the federal war effort had been bolstered by Lincoln's re-election and Sherman's march through Georgia. Confederate forces were left with desperate holding actions and proved to be effective only in southern Virginia and the Carolinas. In North Carolina, the Confederate offensive efforts in 1864 had gained little. As the year came to an end, morale was sinking and desertions increased. Early 1865 would bring the fall of Wilmington, the last major southern port operating, and a further advance by Sherman's army, now through the Carolinas. North Carolina would see some of the war's final campaigns. <laughs> 